Welcome back to Hardware Unboxed. I'll admit that when I was first approached to test out BenQ's new Mobius EX2510 monitor that I wasn't all that excited. It's a 24.5 inch 1080p 144Hz IPS display and I've checked out a few of those in the past so really this wasn't shaping up to be something new or interesting. However, after putting this display through its paces, I was pleasantly surprised with what it's offering. I think we might have a decent competitor to the AOC 24G2 on our hands. So hopefully this is a review worth watching. What BenQ is bringing to the table here in the 1080p 144Hz IPS class is a different display panel to AOC and some of those cheaper budget offerings. BenQ appear to be using a panel from AU Optronics, while AOC uses a Panda panel, hence the difference between the BenQ's 24.5 inch size, one of AUO's favorites, and the AOC's 23.8 inches. Not that this size difference is noticeable in practice. Similar feature set otherwise, we get adaptive sync variable refresh rate support listed as AMD FreeSync Premium, but this will work fine with both AMD and Nvidia GPUs. There's supposed HDR functionality, although as there is no local dimming, this isn't really an HDR panel, so we won't be covering that much in today's review. We're also seeing a standard sRGB panel. As for pricing, BenQ are introducing this display at $250 US dollars, which puts it in the premium category of 1080p 144Hz monitors, along with stuff like the ASUS VG259Q. This does make it around $50 more expensive than the AOC 24G2, if you can find one in stock, so we'll have to see whether strong performance makes the EX2510 a worthwhile option. Aussie pricing is around the $380 mark. The build quality BenQ is used here falls somewhere between premium and budget. The overall design aesthetic is quite nice, with slim bezels, simple matte plastic on the rear, and a solid construction. All the outer surfaces are plastic though, so while the base of the stand is silver, it has just a plastic finish, which I guess is fine enough. I'm also not a huge fan of the orange strip. I don't really think that's necessary, and would have preferred a more color neutral design. The stand supports a good range of motion with height, tilt, and swivel functionality. A little surprising that it can't also be put into a portrait orientation, although that could be down to the monitor's chin, which houses an ambient light sensor that can be used with BenQ's Brightness Intelligence Plus feature. Basically, this just varies the color temperature of the monitor based on the ambient lighting conditions. A neat feature for those that want it, but not something I'd personally use. Speaking of features, BenQ love to use buzzwords with their monitors. This monitor has stuff like HDRI and True Sound by Travolo to go with BenQ Eye Care and BI Plus. Most of these things are just marketing BS. I mean, here BenQ is seriously trying to tell buyers that the built-in speakers offer depth, emotion, and intensity like never before. I mean, yeah, they, they don't. The HDRI mode even gets a dedicated button on the front of the display, and while I'm sure some people will appreciate this trickery, it's really nothing more than an Instagram-like filter for your monitor that boosts contrast and saturation. With that said, marketing BS aside, the OSD is quite good from BenQ thanks to a combination of a directional toggle for navigation and this customizable quick settings menu, which can give easy access to things like brightness and overdrive controls. Most of the features here are more geared towards colors and visuals, so if you're looking for cheat crosshairs and stuff like that, it doesn't appear to be included here. As for display inputs, we get two HDMI 2.0 and one DisplayPort 1.2. Response time performance is usually what people are most interested in with our reviews, so let's dive right in. BenQ offers four overdrive settings here under the AMA heading. Not the clearest labeling given there's no mention of what AMA actually stands for, but whatever, there are four settings. AMA0 is overdrive disabled, and this allows us to see native panel performance, which in this case is a 6.22 millisecond greater gray response time average. This is actually good enough for 144Hz gaming right off the bat, with 89% of transitions completing within a reasonable tolerance of the refresh window. It's not the best this panel can do though, so let's move on. AMA1 is the default mode. Here we see an improvement to a 4.71 millisecond greater gray average with no significant increase to overshoot. This allows for 100% refresh rate compliance, so the EX2510 is definitely a true 144Hz display without issue. This is actually really good performance, and I suspect most people will be very happy to use this mode. AMA2 pushes the display to its limits with some unusual overdrive characteristics. Rise times that end just short of full white have a bit of overshoot, however, most other transitions don't appear to be affected. We get a 3.81 millisecond greater gray average here, which is superior to the previous mode, although overshoot has increased. I didn't find this overshoot behavior to be too noticeable while gaming though. 
Then with AMA set to 3, the maximum mode, we see a 3.17 millisecond greater grey average, but with significant overshoot. So this is not a mode that I'd recommend using. As for performance across the variable refresh range, the fast AMA2 mode is really only suitable for gaming in the high refresh zone, so anything above 120Hz or so. If you know you'll be consistently hitting 120fps or greater, it might be worth considering this mode to shave off 1 millisecond from the average response time. At 100Hz and below though, overshoot becomes more noticeable. However, for gaming across the entire refresh range, say at times you'll be gaming at 60fps and other times at 140fps, I'd keep the display on the default AMA1 setting. You get great performance at 144Hz with no smearing and no significant ghosting, and this holds steady right through to 60Hz with performance around the 5 millisecond mark on average. As performance is still really solid at 144Hz in the AMA1 mode, I'd say the EX2510 does provide us with a single overdrive setting that's usable across the whole refresh range. AMA2 provides us a small bonus at those high refresh rates if required, but AMA1 is decent. Often you'll see overdrive settings sacrifice high refresh rate performance to hit strong results at lower refreshes, but this isn't the case here with the EX2510, and it's all achieved using default settings as well. Comparing the EX2510 up against other monitors shows pretty favourable results. In our best or maximum performance chart, the EX2510 has response time performance in the range of 240Hz IPS monitors. We aren't getting the refresh rate to match, this is just a 144Hz monitor, but nevertheless that does give the EX2510 an edge on other 1080p 144Hz monitors we've tested. In particular, this monitor is approximately 1 millisecond or 28% faster than 144Hz IPS monitors based on the Panda panel, like the AOC 24G2, although this does come at the expense of higher overshoot. When viewing average performance across the entire refresh range, the EX2510 offers a similar response time experience to the 24G2 and Pixio PX247. However, the difference here comes in terms of overshoot. The EX2510 has essentially no inverse ghosting when offering a 4.98 millisecond average response time, with no significant overshoot at any refresh rate. Meanwhile, the AOC 24G2 has quite a bit of overshoot down around 60Hz in the mode shown here, which contributes to a higher level of inverse ghosting overall. What this means in practice is that the EX2510 delivers consistently strong performance across its refresh range without overdrive adjustment. On the other hand, the cheaper 24G2 that uses a Panda panel suffers from overshoot issues at lower refresh rates and doesn't have a single overdrive mode suitable for all gaming. Therefore, the EX2510 is a better performing monitor as I'd expect at a higher price. This can be shown further when looking at 60Hz performance. While the EX2510 maintains a 5.31 millisecond greater grey average using the same overdrive mode as the previous chart, the 24G2 requires you to turn down the overdrive to get usable performance at this refresh rate. As such, it ends up performing below the EX2510, which makes it not as good for lower refresh rate gaming. Refresh rate compliance is fantastic with 100% of transitions meeting the requirements of 144Hz gaming. Average error rates are fine, and highlight that to get this level of performance, BenQ have optimized their overdrive to push the panel to its limits. Then for dark level smearing, obviously not an issue with this IPS display, but this chart is useful for those that are tossing up between something IPS or something VA. While VAs are cheaper, typically they are twice as slow or more for dark transitions. Input lag is fantastic, with close to zero processing delay on the side of the monitor. When combined with great response times and a solid refresh rate, the EX2510 puts up total input lag of 7.3 milliseconds from input to completed image on the screen. That's several milliseconds better than other 1080p 144Hz monitors I've tested. Probably not a noticeable difference for most gamers, but it's a good result. Then for power consumption, we aren't quite at the super efficient level of the 24G2, but a sub 20 watt result is still strong. BenQ also offer a backlight strobing mode with this display, called the Blur Reduction Mode. It's okay, it's far from the worst I've seen, but there is still some strobe crosstalk present at 144Hz, so you will get a double image on the screen when using it. It's similar, maybe a little better than what the AOC 24G2 provides in its backlight strobing mode. In terms of colour performance, one trade-off that has been made is a lack of a wide colour gamut. While the 24G2 can hit about 89% P3 coverage, the EX2510 does not exceed the sRGB colour space, although it does hit 98% sRGB coverage. This has pros and cons. Buyers that want the higher vibrance and saturation of a wide gamut panel are missing out. However, sRGB only panels tend to be more accurate from the factory for displaying sRGB content, which is still the vast majority of content displayed on a PC today, including while gaming. 
The EX2510 has great factory calibration. In grayscale, this display hits a Delta E2000 average below 1.29, and in the more stringent Delta E ITP average, we get a result of 4.1. That's pretty strong, and with a relatively flat CCT average and good gamma curve, we see good results out of the box. This continues into our color tests, and while the EX2510 isn't perfect here, we see numbers around a 2.0 average from Delta E2000, which again is pretty close to accurate. These results are slightly better than what you get from the 24G2. When calibrated, the EX2510 offers very good Delta E performance across the range as you'd expect from an sRGB IPS panel like this. While factory performance is pretty good, this takes it just that step further to become as good as it gets. Patreon members can download the ICC profiles we create, as always, links in the description. For brightness, you won't find anything amazing here, with results around 330 nits, although that should be fine for most indoor use. Contrast, on the other hand, is weak at just 926 to 1. There's always a bit of variance between units, so it's possible my unit is a bit below average here. In any case, I'd expect the EX2510 to have worse contrast than the 24G2 by quite a way, if that's something that matters to you, and for a lot of people it does, especially those that game in dark environments. Viewing angles are great, typical of most IPS panels that we test. Uniformity was average though, with a bit of fall off around the edges of the monitor, although it's no significant tint in different areas, and it has pretty good dark level uniformity. This isn't the sort of monitor I'd use for serious color work, but for gaming, it delivers pretty good color results on the whole. Overall, I was pleasantly surprised by the BenQ EX2510. What I was expecting was a more expensive version of the AOC 24G2 with similar performance, but what we ended up seeing was a decent performance uplift that will interest those after a more premium 1080p 144Hz monitor. The choice to use an AU Optronics panel doesn't make it a better monitor in every regard, but where it counts, the EX2510 does deliver a superior experience. In most instances, the EX2510 delivers faster response times or better overshoot handling, or both. In particular, this monitor is faster at both ends of the refresh rate range, and is able to deliver a consistent experience across the range with a single overdrive mode. That's what I like to see from higher end products within a spec category, and with some careful overdrive optimization, BenQ are delivering that nicely with this monitor. On top of great gaming performance and low input lag, we're getting the benefits we usually see from an IPS panel. Great viewing angles, decent factory calibration, nice colors, and no dark level smearing. There are some weak points specific to this display, like lower than average contrast and the lack of a wide color gamut may disappoint some, but overall, I think the image quality you're getting here is very good, and certainly a lot better than a TN display. In fact, I'm kind of surprised that BenQ focused on stuff like sound quality, HDR filters, and eye care functionality on their product page for this display. Those aren't the selling points to a gaming monitor, and there's no need to go wild with the marketing BS on a product like this. It's a great product on its own, and now's the basics of a gaming monitor, like response time performance. I guess for many buyers, the question at the end of the day will be, should I pay the extra cash on a product like the EX2510, which goes for around $250, or save a bit of money and opt for the AUC 24 g 2 or a similar sub $200 display? That's a pretty tricky question to answer, and ultimately, it comes down to what you're after and how much you can afford. In simple terms, if you want the best performance, get the EX2510. If you want a good experience at a cheaper price, the 24G2 will be for you. I don't think the EX2510 is outrageous at $250 given it is the better monitor overall, but it's hard to ignore the value of the 24G2, which can be found for as little as $180. I'd still have the AOC option as the better value product overall. The EX2510 would be very hard to go past at $200 though, and I feel the sweet spot may be around $220, so we'll see where pricing lands over time. Of course, there are lots of other 1080p 144Hz monitors out there, including many that we haven't tested, so it's worth doing your research and looking at all the other options, including those from Acer, Asus, and others, plus the larger panel size options. Anyway, that's it for this review of the BenQ EX2510. If you're interested in supporting our monitor testing, we do have our Patreon page. Links are in the description below. You'll get our ICC profiles, monthly live streams, Discord chat, all that fun stuff. You can also subscribe to get more monitor reviews in your inbox, more monitor testing, all that sort of thing. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.